Dr. Doreen Grand is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Dr. Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. I, can I just say, Mad, I love you and I want you to be my new best friend. She wrote in and said, my son is 13, but somehow I have been fighting the food selectivity battle for 113,574,576 years. Oh, yeah. Mad, I, I just love you. That cracked me up. Um, but I feel your pain, Mad. Um, but it's it, it feels counterintuitive, but winnowing some things out will make it possible for more things to be there. Uh, yeah. Evelyn has written that. in, go get, go Sorry, ahead. Go. I just want to make another comment on this because, you know, there are different reasons that our kids become picky to begin with. The primary reason, according to all the science that's out there and all the studies over the years is just this fact that they, uh, crave the items that they are more allergic to, right? And then they eat those things and this causes inflammation and then it's that cycle we were just talking about. However, there are also other kids and us as well where there are other factors that are affecting what they eat. For instance, it could be an emotional thing, right? All of us, we have our emotional foods that we like stressful, you know, foods that have been associated with stress or whatever that we don't eat and things that, what, what is it called the term, like uh, foods that calm you down or make you, you know, relax um, or whatever. Comfort so, foods. Comfort yeah. foods, right? So we have all of that as well. And then the other thing with our kids, don't forget, our kids also have sensory issues. So as I've worked with a lot of kids who have uh, been picky now, this child that we were talking about, Shannon, I'm not worried because he has a, a broad array in terms of the texture of the food already. So I know that he doesn't have an issue with texture, but some of our kids do have an issue with texture. So they will only eat crunchy foods or they will only eat mushy foods. That's a completely different issue. And you do need to work on that as well because they do actually... In fact, not only do they get over that and do they learn to broaden and eat all kinds of different foods, but as they do that, the muscles inside the mouth develop and it also contributes to the development of speech. Because if you think about it, when you're chewing and uh, eating, your tongue is moving a lot. And when you're talking, your tongue is also moving a lot. So it helps that process. But I don't want to confuse our, our viewers because there are different issues. Now, I went straight to talking about broadening the diet for this particular child because as I listened to the existing diet, it was clear that texture is not an issue. He had bread in there, cracker, you know, all sorts of different textures, peanut butter, etc. So that was not an issue for this child. But for some kids, it is. And for some kids, it's also emotional aspects that interfere with this as well. And, and in fact, that's what they're writing it about. Bianca says it literally comes down to my son smelling a cracker, licking it and knowing the difference in brand or type, like a, like a supersonic sense. Oh um, yeah. And that's the thing, you know, we often forget that our kids have a very, very heightened uh, ability when it comes to sensory uh, issues, much more so than any of us. Right. So we have to remember those things. And Bianca also says that he, you know, is it's his loss of foods uh, seems to be based on experiences. For example, going through a divorce and being forced to stay with mm -hmm. his dad who had never cared for him before, bad experience, lost five foods, uh, list his list his juice that we used to put his uh, vitamins into. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, it, I, I find this so fascinating because just like for the holidays, we just went through the holidays and people pair pleasant experiences to food. And then, and then we just want the food. Like when we're a kid and we get, you know, Sorry. this type of cake or whatever that grandma used to make for Christmas. And then we end up having that every Christmas, even when we know it's not good for us anymore because we've paired it with a pleasant experience. Yeah. Our yeah. kids can also pair a negative experience, correct? So true. And also Bianca's point makes me realize one other thing, which is very interesting, is routine. 
So n- another aspect for our kids is that routine. And, you know, sometimes you have a child where, you know, you'll give them a certain food and then you'll put their drink on the table right after or something like that. And you break that routine and that completely throws them off. So she's right. And I've seen that children will, uh, when they're in a newer environment, when there is an adult who doesn't know the child's routine, uh, you know, when the, there's an adult who perhaps doesn't know the child's preferences, those types of things absolutely can also interact with, uh, with what they're willing to do, including what they're willing to eat. But the main thing I want everybody to know is that these uh, food selectivity issues that you're talking about, they're individual and there's different types and different uh, responses for them. But this kind of stuff, although it moves slow, it's infinitely workable. We were saying yesterday on the show, Dr. Grand Pichet, that one of the things I love about having done this show for 10 years is that we've seen people go through these interventions and get to the other side. So I mentioned yesterday, do you remember in like the first year that we were doing the show, there was the strawberry mom and she wrote it. We called her the strawberry mom because we, you know, we don't like to give out names. And she wrote it and said, how do I get my kid to eat a strawberry? Yeah. And, and it took like from beginning to end, it took, I don't know, three months, six months, but whatever. But it's hilarious to me now because that was 10 years ago. And now her kid eats the rainbow. Yeah. Um, and, and Johanny just wrote in and said, my kid just ate asparagus last night. Seriously. I would never have thought that that was possible before. So let's, let's count the wins and, and remember that this kind of thing can happen. Um, but slow, slow, but progress is available. This is, this is not like some, you know, there are some issues where it's like, oh, it's really hard to crack and, and, and whatever. And we're not sure why people do this or that or whatever, but it seems like the food selectivity thing, you behaviorists really have a hold on. Oh yeah. And it's, and it's common, Shannon. And I gotta tell you guys, like, you know, we've worked with, I have personally, and many of us have worked with children who were referred to us with a G2. So in other words, they had a gastro tube in their stomach because they had never eaten. And the child was now four. And we had to work with the child to get them to eat foods so that the physicians could remove the G tube so that they could actually, which, which meant we had to get the child to, you know, go every step from opening their mouth, putting anything inside their mouth. Um, and swallowing, which is a whole different thing, chewing, which is a whole different thing, and then broadening the diet. And we've done that successfully. And so it does take time and it does take, uh, you have to make sure that it is highly rewarding. I mean, you know, one of the things we do with our kids is that when they are, we treat the foods that they don't want to eat like bitter med- medicine that's what it's like for them right and we will reward them beyond anything like we'll turn on the tv and throw a party and all this sort of stuff if they just take a morsel of that food and then they love that and we will gradually increase that but it takes time and it does it the, the thing when you have a behavior analyst or you know someone experienced doing this the difference is that they kind of do it. It's their job to do this. They have it on a organized schedule. It's kind of like working with a nutritionist, right? Like for me this morning, you know, early, I just came back to my home in Los Angeles and I was trying to like uh, my new year's resolution, you know, I was like, I'm going to do all organic this year. I'm going to completely change what we eat in the home. So I'm completely on board with you guys. Like I'm I'm going just a little bit further and I'm planning to do like farming in my backyard and going a little crazy here. But, you know, that started with me throwing away a ton of food that was in the fridge. And it's hard. It's it's not an easy task, but you know what? I'm going to do my best and I'll keep reporting back to you guys. So if I can do it, you can do it for sure. Oh, sister, I've had to remove all salt from my diet in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I I would kill someone for a saltine. <laughs> and I don't like saltines. Uh, it's hard. But I'm but I I'm finding that I'm enjoying different foods because I, you know, I, I have my palate is cleared of salt. It yeah. is a very interesting thing.
If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.